I'm thankful for the Bible Project video for giving us such good information. And if in at time I, I do not echo what you've heard, that's just difference of interpretation. I, I, but, but the videos are absolutely well done and, and theologically sound. Otherwise, we wouldn't show them. We wouldn't show them. So, to summarize the book of Psalms in, in less than a sentence, collections of prayers to and songs about God. Words about God. Yes, inspired, so words of God as well. But you understand what we have here are men who are voicing, whether as a prayer or as a song, words about God. But at the same time, I don't want you to panic. That's why I'm saying to you that what we have in the book of Psalms is inspired of God's Scripture. So the words about God are also the word of God. But we're dealing with words about God. Indirect revelation. Within the Old Testament, we do have two significant examples of direct revelation. One being the law. Whenever you read a thou shalt or a thou shalt not, you understand that's not Moses speaking, that's God speaking. Direct address to us. When you look at the prophets, we haven't covered the prophets yet. The prophets will say, thus says the Lord. They're not speaking their own words. They're speaking the words of God. Direct revelation. We have both kinds within the Old Testament. We have words of God, words about God, all of which are inspired scripture. The, the name of the book is Psalms, and that comes from this Greek word. You can't perhaps decipher the, the phonetic equivalence of the Greek letters, but that basically is pronounced psalmos. So when you say psalms, you're speaking Greek. Add that to your list of accomplishments, right? And you have the meaning of what the word psalm means, and, and it is a fitting description of the book. But the name of the book in the, in the Hebrew Bible is, is not psalmos, but um, Tehillim, which also translates to hymns of praise. You've already learned about the structure. You've learned a lot more about the structure than I will offer. The book does subdivide into five books where I diverge. I actually include Psalm 1 and 2 within the first book. I know I'm not supposed to use anything other than the ESV. I'm using the New American Standard, and the New American Standard includes Psalm 1 and 2 two in book one. So that is a difference. There is intentional structure, yes. Each of these five books concludes with a doxology. That's a, that's a praise. The whole book of Psalms concludes with a doxology, Psalm 150. That is a, a word of praise. How fitting that the book begins with a wisdom psalm setting before us two ways to live. And blessed is the man, we're told, that meditates on the Word of God. And that's the, the wonderful introduction to this whole collection. There is intentionality here. Five books, obviously not done by a mathematician, because five does go into 150 evenly. You see that a mathematician did not divide the book of Psalms. If the mathematician had done it, it would have been 1 through 30, and 31 to 60, and 61 to 90. So it's not done mathematically. Why do we have five books? A couple of, of possibilities, not mutually exclusive. One being the fact that, yes, you have this intentional mirroring of the law. We have five books of the law. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Now we have five books of worship. Five is a significant number in the Old Testament. Also, you could believe that what we have here are stages of development. The book of Psalms grew over time, adding more and more until we get to the final form, which is 150. 
the, the way that you can um, look at the, the Psalms is, yeah, there's some structure here, but you can't go too far. If you were to think that book one represents the oldest material, you would be incorrect because Psalm 90 is written by Moses, and that's book four. In addition, you have Psalms of David that are scattered throughout the five books. So we can't, if we accept this belief that it grew over time, that the oldest material is part of book one, and then the, the next oldest is book two, and so on until the most recent is the last book. You, you, can't, you can't address it that way. Another way that you cannot address it, if you accept that we've got five books of worship and it parallels five books of laws, some scholars, eager to see themes within these five books, thought, well, maybe book one corresponds to Genesis, and maybe book two corresponds to Exodus. Uh, interesting thought that's been pursued with, with little success. So, so even though we may have five books of worship that correspond to five books of law, the individual books don't necessarily respond to each individual book of the law. Okay, so let's, let's move on. All right, right, there is a role of David here. And what I say to my students at Mississippi College that David is the patron and I define for us what patron means. Contributor to, force behind, and influence over. David is certainly the patron of worship literature in Israel, but that does not mean that David wrote every psalm. In fact, he didn't even write half. If you know your math, you know that 73 is not even 50% of 150. You do see the psalms that have a connection to David. And Yes, I'm imposing upon you some Hebrew. We don't even have a full sentence to understand the connection between David and that particular psalm. You actually have what you're seeing here, four letters. If you start at the right, what looks like a question mark is the Lameth, and that letter is a preposition, and it can mean to, for, or belonging to. Then you have three more letters, and that's pronounced David, which is in Hebrew, David. So, la David, what does that mean? It can mean belonging to David, which would mean composition. These are David's psalms. Just as a possibility, I'm not here to rock your boat. Could it also mean dedication, that some Israelite in honor of the king to David or for David composed the psalm. I'm just saying it's possible, but we know based upon David's life that he was the consummate musician and he clearly was capable of writing all 73 that, that bear his name. We have already been introduced to other contributors. Just a couple of, of, of observations here. One third of the psalms have no name attached to them. We have no idea. And of course, we've already talked about Moses' connection. He contributes one. And we also, you've heard about Solomon's connection. He wrote Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. Types of Psalms, which has been popular in Old Testament study to categorize the Psalms. May I say, as a caution, though helpful, these categories are after the fact and applied to the material. So, we're using our profiles, definitions to categorize the Psalms. And that means that sometimes there's disagreement. Well, you put Psalm, fill in the blank, in this category, but it seems to have characteristics of this other. And the problem is, we're applying after the fact categories, labels. You understand that the Israelite psalmist didn't wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to do Thanksgiving today because yesterday I did a lament and tomorrow I think I'll do a wisdom psalm. So although the categories are helpful, they're not, as, as we would say, airtight in, in how they, they 
categorize what we have. But it's, it's a start to, to get a better grasp on this largest of books of our Bible. And by the way, it's a pet peeve of mine, but it doesn't matter to you because you're not in my class and you're not getting a grade. I tell my students, there are no chapters in Psalms. So when someone says Psalm chapter 4, that really gets on my nerves. But uh, each of these are individual. So it's Psalm 4. It's not Psalm chapter 4. They're individual collected together into one book. But that's my pet peeve and you're not interested. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's talk about the categories. What about the categories? Perhaps you deciphered from the Bible Project video, most of the Psalms are lament. Most of them. That's, that's fascinating. And it leads to a true-false question in my class. True or false? The Psalms are all joy-filled. No, false. In fact, more of the Psalms are laments. And you see the definition of laments, expressing struggles, disappointments, and sufferings to God. And there's two kinds of laments, those that are voiced by the individual and those that represent a group or corporate. And the best example, I've only given you one, is Psalm 22, which Jesus quotes from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, can you get any more lamentable than that? But what we have to understand, because it's not our nature, it's not our culture to to lament, We're so stoic. We're Westerners, especially guys. The the communication is you you don't cry. You you don't show emotion. That's weakness, and and, and that's how how we we grow up. Well, in, in the Eastern world, everybody shows emotion. You don't have to wonder if someone in the Middle East is happy, angry, or sad. Then there's something to be said about that. So the way that they are, that's how they relate in their faith. And that's what we have here in the Psalms. So you have this Psalm, which is a lament, but understand that the lament is not a gripe session. It isn't. So like the most famous of the lament, Psalm 22 starts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer and by night, but I have no rest. But hold on. As you continue in this psalm, there's a shift, there's a transition, and it begins in verse 19. But thou, O Lord, be not far off. O thou, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Now, what's incredible is when you read verse 22 of Psalm 22 to verse 31, it is as much a praise of God as any other psalm. And you're thinking, well, how did it started in the dumps? How, how did he get that far? Because not denying reality, God, my situation's tough, but I'm not denying you either. You're absolutely bigger than my situation. And I'm inviting you, please, I'm desperate for you to intervene. And that's the role of the lament. It's not a gripe session. But it's the opportunity to, with one hand, hold on to reality and the other hand to hold tightly on to God because he does make that difference. We have the Thanksgiving Psalm. It is different than the hymn of praise. I'm, I'm, I'm moving to the next slide. The Thanksgiving Psalm, you'll notice, praises God for what he has done, whereas the hymn of praise, which sounds so similar, praises God for who he is. Y'all who he is, is worthy of our praise. Even if he did nothing more for us, who he is, is enough to praise him for an eternity. But we also praise him for what he does. Songs of Zion focus on Jerusalem. Two kinds of, of psalms connected to the kingship or royalty. You have the royal psalm and the enthronement psalm, which celebrates the coronation of a king. You've got examples listed here. And then I've already mentioned the wisdom psalm. Psalm 1 is a great example. You, you talk about a contrast in terms of not being that emotional is, psalm, is, is wisdom psalms. Uh, the lament, pretty powerful emotion. Thanksgiving, hymn of praise, pretty powerful emotion. And the imprecatory psalm is pretty powerful in emotion. But the, the wisdom psalms that appear scattered throughout are pretty calm because when you're teaching, you're, 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 you're pretty much calm as you're communicating the material. And the wisdom psalms present 
how to live life well and to live life wisely rather than foolishly. The imprecatory psalm, this is not something that we're familiar with as much either. And the word imprecatory really means curse. Now, this is not like cussing, so I don't want you to think that there's there's an encouragement here to, to be profane. No. But it is pretty raw in terms of emotion. The best example, not the only example, is Psalm 137. Are you familiar with this psalm? Takes place during the time of the exile. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. So here you have folks that have been removed from their land years earlier by Nebuchadnezzar. They're far from home, and they don't like it. They don't like the Babylonians. So how does this amazing Psalm 137 conclude? Verse 8 and 9, O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, how blessed will be the one who repays you. Verse 9, how blessed will be the one, listen to this, who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. What? That's in my Bible? Yeah, that's in your Bible. Here are people who are saying, God, how wonderful it will be for, the, for, for those Babylonian children to have their skulls smashed against the rock. Man, we would never even think about expressing such a thing. So what's the purpose of this? Again, the emotion is real. You express it. You feel it. You don't suppress it. What do you do with it? You vent, but you vent properly. You take it to God. And that's the role of the imprecatory psalm. God, instead of me acting in my emotion and doing something that I regret, I'm taking this to you and you help me work through it. I want to smash those Babylonian kids. I really do. But that's not right. So God, I'm not denying what I feel, but would you help me work through this anger that's real in my life? Y'all, do you realize that we as a society don't handle anger well? I mean, that's the very reason that we have road rage. We have people going back to their places of business and, and shooting. We have parents in the stands fighting while their kids are trying to play a soccer game. We, we don't deal well with anger. Is anger wrong? Well, you haven't read Ephesians 4.26 recently. Paul said, be angry and sin not. What do you do with your anger? And the imprecatory psalm was a way to process anger. Because if you suppress it or deny it, it seeps when you don't expect it to. They knew how to deal with their emotion. There's some information about the content. I won't talk about that, but I love this, and here's where I'll conclude. And God willing, I won't go over too much, Dr. Greg. And that is the function of the Psalms, very practical. Yes, I I agree with with Dr. Gag. I mean, who doesn't have a favorite Psalm? And even if another book of the Bible is your favorite Bible book, there's got to be a Psalm that you would say, that's still my go-to. You know, for me, the book of Job's my favorite book, but I could tell you Psalm 103 is my favorite Psalm. We all are that way. Why is that? Because the Psalms are true to life. Who doesn't relate other than an individual who's not living? Who doesn't therefore relate to the book of Psalms? Because every kind of experience and all kinds of emotion are represented in the Psalms. So there is some Psalm, believe it or not, right now that connects to how you feel right now. You might be thinking, I'm going through an experience that's never been expressed. Oh, I disagree with you. There's something here that that can put into words what you might find difficult to voice as a prayer or to share with someone who might wonder, well, what's going on with you? How how are you doing? There's a psalm that expresses the inexpressible. And what's beautiful is you don't have to become a poet and figure out how to put your words to paper. Just take a psalm and pray it and take it to God. There's a psalm for your experience, whatever it is right now, And there's a psalm, whatever your emotion right now. In other words, the psalms encourage us to come as we are and to be honest with God. Now I'm going over, but I'm going to try to do this in about a couple of minutes. But there's going to be somebody here that's going to be a legalist and said, you went over two minutes. Okay, you're right. I grew up at a time of formality. I'm 54. So going to church meant looking your best. And, and being on your best behavior. 
even when you didn't feel like it. And you certainly didn't express anything that might be considered raw emotion if it in any way sounded disrespectful. And if you thought that way, you felt that way, you canned it. You put on a smile, you came and worshiped, and that's, that's, how I, that's, that's my growing up. I don't think any preacher ever communicated that explicitly, but that was my growing up. And at the same time, I read all of these words, especially from the Old Testament, of raw emotion, and, and, and people like Jeremiah saying in Jeremiah chapter 20, God, you deceived me, and I was deceived. And I read words from Job, and I, and, and I thought, wow, this guy's railing against God. And then, of course, all the Psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, I, and finally, the connection occurred. Wow, God's not too small to handle my honesty. I can be forthright with God. He already knows what I think and I feel. Y'all, may I say to you that God would rather you be honest with Him than you walk out or turn your back on Him because you think, I can't say that because somebody might get upset if I said such a thing. I love being a Southern Baptist, but we have to get everything done in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, right? I hope at some point in your life you get to worship in an African-American church. I had the opportunity with, a, with a, a former student that I had named Jamela Burnett, who tragically died of leukemia. She was an MC student, and she said, Dr. Park, I want you to preach at my church. And I said, oh, man, that's going to be fun. Sure, where do you worship? She worshiped on, uh, off of Watkins Drive here in North Jackson at a Church of God in Christ. Their church service started at 5. This is when Morrison Heights started at 6. And I said to Marianne, I'll be at McAllister's long before you'll be finished with church. Right. At 645 is when I got to preach. So what did they do? And here's what they did. There was a time of testimony. There was. And the drummer played at the drums and the pianist played at the piano. And people would just stand up. It wasn't planned. And people would just speak some were elated, and they'd say, oh, God, thank you so much, God, for answering that prayer. And the pianist would play in accordance, and the drummer would be enthusiastic. And then there would be someone that would be crying. It almost sounded like they were angry with God. God, don't you know my need, my situation? God, why haven't you intervened? But God, I know you're going to follow through. And the drummer played accordingly, and the pianist played. And it was like, it was beautiful. And I thought, here are people that are, that, that, that are taking their burdens and giving it to God, and then they're leaving. And they're really connecting. Whether you can do that in a worship service or not, you can do that privately. And I had one of those, finally, I had one of those times. I was, it was a tough summer for our family, and, and it was not a situation that was my fault or anyone else's fault. It was an opportunity, I thought, for God to intervene. So Marianne and I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. God, this is your time to glorify yourself. Please come through. God, please, we believe you. We trust you. And the whole summer came and went, and God didn't answer our prayer. Man, I was upset. And you know what? It was finally on I-55. I can remember it to this day. I was driving from Macomb. I was coming back to, to Clinton. And you know what? I finally did what the psalmist did. Well, God already knew what I felt. So I just said, God, you disappointed me. You let me down. God, why? And so there were tears that, that I shed as I, as I cried out to God. And y'all, I'm here to tell you, I lived, I survived that. God didn't crush me. He didn't send the lightning bolt. The earth didn't open up and swallow me. And he listened to me. And finally, because he worked with me through it, I finally said, God, I love you and I trust you. Thanks for just letting me share, letting me vent. The Psalms encourage you to do that. I hope you will. I invite you tonight to turn in your Bible to Psalm 30. Dr. Park had this in a category. Does anybody remember the category? See, you skipped over it and they didn't learn a thing. Okay, there's a heading at the top. Who's the author of Psalm 30? David, that's right. What's the occasion for Psalm 30 according to the heading? The dedication of the temple. 
What chapter does the dedication of the temple come in, Dr. Park? If we're talking 1 Kings, it's 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 8. What chapter does David die in, Dr. Park? He dies in 1 Kings chapter 2. That's correct. <laughs> so how does a dead man author a psalm for the dedication of the temple? all kinds of weird questions out there about stuff like this. Well, the short answer is he didn't have to write it on the day of the dedication, right? I mean, he could have written the psalm before he died and it was then used for the dedication of the temple. He did raise the money, right? He does raise the money for the temple. He knows there's going to be a temple. He writes a song even though he knows that he will not be there to present it or sing it or have it sung or hear it sung or whatever. So don't get caught up with a lot of the things that folks will point out and say, well, you know, that proves the Bible's not reliable. Everybody knows David died six chapters before the dedication, and this says he was used at the dedication. This is a psalm you know. Even if you don't know, you know it. And it is a psalm of thanksgiving. But remember, it was people after David who decided that certain psalms were psalms of lament and psalms of thanksgiving or psalms of praise. It's not like the Jews sat around and said, let's call up another song and call it a song of praise. Make sure it's praiseworthy. They just wrote, and uh, we have the benefit of that. So we're going to read together Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. And have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you've brought up my soul from Sheol. You have restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you've made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. I want to suggest to you that we could simply... Entitle this song is what most uh, Bible interpreters focus on. Uh, Joy comes in the morning. But I would go further to say, because the Lord's mercy is near. So joy comes because the Lord's mercy is near. We note in the opening stanza of this particular psalm, verses 1 to 3, that David mentions a time when he required the Lord's intervention in his life in healing. Verse 2, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. And you'll note that his sickness apparently was a sickness virtually unto death. Verse 3, you have brought me, brought up my soul from Sheol. Sheol is the Old Testament word for the place of the dead. So David is literally on the brink of death. Now, the psalm specifically does not tell us uh, exactly what incident in David's life is being referenced here. We don't know what David is thinking about, but there apparently is an incident where David was near death. He was experiencing great sickness or in perhaps uh, a, a judgment of God, and he cries out to the Lord for mercy. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Bible interpreters like to gnaw on such meaty bones. 
I'm not going to ask Dr. Park publicly what he believes is David's sin here that requires uh, the Lord to heal him or sickness that requires him to heal him. I'm just going to tell him what he ought to believe. I'm going to tell you too. All right, so here we go. 2 Samuel 24. If you're reading along with us in the men's mentoring program, last week we read 2 Samuel 24. This is uh, one of the great, what's the greatest sin of David in the Bible? Adultery, right? Then the subsequent murder of uh, her husband. What's the second greatest sin of David listed in the Bible? 2 Samuel 24. This is a, not a trick question. All answers lead to easy, all questions lead to easy answers. All right, 2 Samuel 24. And what occurs in 2 Samuel 24? David numbers the army. He counts his soldiers. Does that sound like something that army people would do as a rule? Yeah, I mean, I would suggest to you that there's probably not an army anywhere who doesn't count their soldiers. David counts his soldiers. He takes a census of his army in 2 Samuel 24, and God hates it. And he brings a profound judgment. So we're going to read a bit of 2 Samuel 24. Verse 10. This is the aftermath. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, very unfortunate name, Gad, David's seer, saying, go and say to David, thus saith the Lord, three things I offer you, choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said, shall three years of famine come to you in your land or will you flee three months from your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let not me fall into the hand of a man. You always want the source of your mercy to be a God, not man. You're a lot safer in the hands of God than you are in the hands of men when it comes to dispensing mercy. Said another way, God is far more merciful than any man you've ever met. That's the reason none of us are dead yet. Because of his mercy. Because every last one of us have sinned against him. So, verse 15, the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, that's north to south in Israel, 70,000 men. Why? Because David counted the army. Now, if you're not a thinking person, you don't understand what it's just happened. Why is that a problem? That a king, that God's king, would sin by counting his army. Because you see, David, though he was humble and a man after God's own heart, occasionally thought highly of himself. And one of the reasons he thought highly of himself was because he had an army bigger than anybody else. And he knew that that was a way to make him feel important. You probably have stuff in your life that you think 
by having that stuff, you're important. To which I say, be careful. Secondly, David, like every other man, is inclined to put his trust in his earthly strength. David is a warrior. The very reason he was not allowed to build the temple, because he was a man who had taken lives. David is a warrior. And David understood that he was strong because his army was strong. And his army was the source of his strength. And a general needs to keep his eyes on his army. But God would not have that of his man, the king. God would rather his man, the king, have his eyes on God. Because frankly, God doesn't need David's army or anybody else's army to do a thing. In fact, you'll recall the life of Gideon. God removed his army virtually to nothing, only 300 left, and none of them ever fired a shot because God doesn't need an army to accomplish his will or save his people or save you. So though it seems reasonable that a general would number his army, it is unreasonable and sinful for David to take pride or find his security in that which God has given him. Be careful in your life that you don't find your security in what God has given you. So, verse 15 of 2 Samuel 24. The Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, think of that, the angel was on the brink of destroying Jerusalem. By the way, can I just note there's only one angel doing all this. How many angels does it take? If you think God is... If you think God is not powerful... 70,000 mortal men died in one day because of the hand of one angel. God doesn't need an army. He's got an army, but he doesn't need it. He just needs one angel with the authority of God to do whatever you need in your life. When the angel of the Lord stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aranah, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and be said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. So what is the occasion for Psalm 30? We, we, we don't know for sure, but many Bible interpreters understand David's experience in 2 Samuel 24. Frankly, because we don't know for a fact, we cannot know for a fact, and we won't spend a whole lot more time on it. I do want you to note what happens here. David acknowledges in, in uh, verses 1 to 3 that the Lord is our help and our healer. 
Uh, verse 2, he's very emphatic. The Lord my God, I cry to you for help and you have healed me. I remind you that the Lord is our help and healer. We too must rely upon the Lord. He hears our cry and he answers. We have one healer and that is the Lord God and we must continually look to him. In the second stanza, verses 4 and 5, he points out that God will Relent. His anger is but for a moment, but joy will come in the morning. Morning will come for the people of God. Uh, our, if you will, our season of sadness, our season of sorrow is but for the night, it's but for a season. It is only a season of sadness. This too shall pass, friend. And the reason it shall is because God will see that it does. The Lord promises joy after sorrow. The Lord promises that morning will break for his own. The Lord's mercy is what comforts us. Verses 6 and 7 remind us of something else altogether. You, You may miss this, and I don't want you to. I tried to read it in a way that you would see it. You'll note in verse 6 that David points out his own prosperity and his own attitude is reflected there in the phrase, I shall never be moved. David has a season of arrogance. That's why it seems to coincide with 2 Samuel 24, an arrogant spirit about him. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. It's the attitude of an arrogant man. It's the attitude of one who thinks that somehow his strength is somehow attached to him. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. Then there is a turning, and immediately you made my mountain stand strong. You were great and glorious for me, and then all of a sudden you hid your face. Why does God hide his face from us? Well, the most obvious answer is because of our sin. Why does God remove his hand of favor? Why does God remove his hand of prosperity? Why does God remove his hand of mercy? Well, it's not automatic. Don't draw a hard, bold line. It's guaranteed. But it is true that where our arrogance rises, the face of God turns. James tells us as much in the New Testament. God is near to the brokenhearted, and he resists the proud. I want to suggest to you that God did this for David. We don't know the exact experience, but he says in his prosperity, he will not be moved. God made him great, but then he turned away. Perhaps 2 Samuel 24. I would suggest to you that you would consider your own life today, whether or not indeed you are Proud, self-sufficient, self-reliant. We can cling to the promise of joy, but that joy only comes when we repent of our sin and acknowledge our need for God. And then he concludes the psalm by celebrating the Lord's mercies. And this is where we all want to be, should be, need to be, even tonight. To you, O Lord, he says in verse 8, I cry, I plead for mercy, and he He argues with God, which, as Dr. Park has pointed out, is entirely appropriate. He gives God justification for being merciful to him. Why should you kill me? Because what profit is that for your glory, for your praise, that you would kill me? Rescue me instead so that I could testify of your faithfulness. God leads us from mourning to glory. And then let us rejoice and say so. Let us Add our testimony. Verse 11, you've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. See, this is the witness of God that he does what he does for us that our lips might praise him and celebrate him. Invariably, the Psalms end in a a moment of praise. Even the Psalms of lament ultimately end in a a section of praise, thanking God, rejoicing in God, in spite of this sorrow or this sadness or this suffering or in spite of this experience, 
In the end, I rejoice that God is God and that his praise shall resound across the ages and from my own lips if God will give me life. So I trust that this will again remind you as we read the Psalms that God is at work in our circumstances. And grievous as our sin may be, God is a God of mercy. Let us remind him of our repentance. Let us show him our repentance. And let us cling to his promise of forgiveness. I trust that will be true for you and for me, that we will not cling to our arrogance, but rather we will run to God and seek his mercy. Let's pray together. Father, we honor you again as the one who is the resource of our lives. We don't need an army, we just need our God. We don't need anything else we have either. We don't need our money, we don't need our health, we don't need our programs or our plans, we don't need our connections or our relationships. We don't need anything that man thinks are essential. Instead, what we need is our God. Help us, Father, to examine our lives, to make sure that our security is in you and in nothing else. And then, Lord, help us to draw near to you when we do sin, to seek your hand of forgiveness, to cry out to you for mercy, and to anticipate it, because you are a God of mercy. We praise you tonight. And thank you for your mercy to us. We are blessed. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.